No, it's oh yes, it's on. Okay, so it, it's very directional. Okay, okay, okay. So I have beginning we don't get I'm I'm okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear us? I can be text back. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know whether the chat is disabled, right? In that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I don't have to do anything. You'll just pull up my um, my slides so that you don't. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll, and, and you uh, share screen for the people on Zoom, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that the slides. Can... Can Know how to handle that? I'm not total, totally. So it will be.
Test, test, test. Test, test. Uh, test. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, while folks are uh, just finding their seats, um, I just wanted to uh, welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming and thank everyone uh, for tuning in. Um, on behalf of the Judaic Studies Department, I wanted to welcome you all to the 2024 uh, Francis Haight Height Memorial Lecture. Um, I want to thank the seven departments and programs uh, co-sponsoring this event, and a special thank you um, for all of their help to the teams at the Wolf Institute for the Humanities, uh, the IT department, uh, and a shout out to Professor Sowers and his students for sharing their class time uh, with us. Uh, before introducing... Oh, and Professor Altman's class. Yes, thank you. Sure, how is that? Better? Okay. Uh, so before introducing uh, our guest, I want to thank the Francis Hype Memorial Fund, uh, which generously sponsors this lecture series um, every year. It's truly one of the highlights of our department's programming. Uh, and the family has written a beautiful portrait of Francis Heights, uh, and it's my pleasure to share it now. Uh, Francis Haidt was born in 1923, the child of Russian Jewish immigrants uh, fleeing pogroms. Proud to have been educated by the New York City public school system, she was an alumna of Hunter College High School. She graduated from Brooklyn College in 1944 uh, with a bachelor's in political science, winning the political science medal. Uh, she served in the U.S. Department of State during World War II. Later, she became one of the first women to work as a securities analyst in a Wall Street investment bank. An ardent traveler, Hype had a passion for archaeology and studied cultures past and present, bringing back to her Manhattan apartment objects related to her exploration. In the 1960s and 70s, she actively supported the emigration of Jews from the Soviet Union. She taught her nieces and nephews to live unapologetically as Jews in the free nation to which her parents had fled at the close of the 19th century. Frances Haidt had no children of her own, but for many years she shared her knowledge of Hebrew, Yiddish, and Torah with young people who flocked to the Sunday school classes uh, that she taught and with her family. The Frances Haidt Annual Lecture Series honors this remarkable woman's love of Judaic studies and her commitment to learning and teaching. And I think her example also highlights the potential of public education and the power of alumni to further its mission for future generations. We truly thank the Haidt family for making these events possible and enabling important interdisciplinary conversations like this. Uh, and with that, I'm thrilled to introduce our distinguished speaker. Uh, Magda Tetter is professor of history uh, and the Spidler Chair of Judaic Studies at Fordham University. She is author of uh, four books, uh, including Jews and Heretics in Catholic Poland, Sinners on Trial, Jews and Sacrilege After the Reformation, Blood Libel on the Trail of an Anti-Semitic Myth, and most recently, Christian Supremacy, Reckoning with the Roots of Anti-Semitism and Racism. Her book, Blood Libel, won the 2020 National Jewish Book Award, the George L. Mossy Prize from the American Historical Association, and the Ronald Baden Prize from the 16th Century Society. Uh, she has received numerous prestigious fellowships, uh, such as the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, uh, H.F. Guggenheim Foundation, Radcliffe Institute of Harvard, among uh, many others. Um, she's currently the president of the American Academy of Jewish Research, and we're truly honored to uh, welcome you today.
um, so much for uh, for having me. Thank you so much, so many of you here for coming. Uh, I know it's a busy time of, of year, so uh, I'm really, really grateful. Um, and uh, thank you for for inviting me to this uh, lecture. I didn't know anything about Frances Hyde, so it was uh, very interesting to, to learn about her, uh, her story. So I'm sure many of you, uh, some of you might still remember, uh, many of us remember the 2017 um, Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, where the uh, Confederate uh, racist symbolism um, and symbols clashed with anti-Semitic chants, and as you can see here, um, not clashed, uh, combined, uh, melded together um, uh, in in one uh, in one uh, rally that was uh, supported uh, supporting uh, the uh, preservation of the uh, Robert E. Lee statue that was about to be removed. Uh, so anti-Semitism and anti-Black racism. Uh, we're all in full uh, view for many of us who, who were following these events. And scholars have um, often remarked that those who are uh, racist are also often anti-Semitic. Uh, but as I have been reading the scholarship, I've never found a kind of deeper engagement and explanation of why this might be the case it's just an acknowledgement that this is the case. And um, as I've been um, uh, studying and teaching and writing about anti-Semitism, I've always uh, been frustrated with the scholarship on anti-Semitism that uh, focuses on definitions. What is anti-Semitism? And people argue about it. People write book, books about it, arguing with each other about it. Um, which definition is right, which definition is wrong, do we need that, them, and so on and so forth. Um, the scholarship also focuses on what, when does, uh, on chronology, when does it begin, is it modern, is it pre-modern, is it eternal hatred, is it, has it always been that way, um, uh, is there historical change, how can we talk about it over a long time, and so on and so forth. And, uh, I am a historian, I'd be always still thinking I needed historical explanations, but I also felt like, do these matters? Do these definitions matter? Do, the, do these, why don't we think about uh, what, what people called anti-Semitism anti does, how it functions rather than what it is? Um, and the other thing that, that the scholarship on anti-Semitism uh, does that it focuses on anti-Semites and it focuses on how anti-Semites think and what how they imagine uh, imagine Jews. Um, so scholars to explain anti-Semitism to say what it is, they focus on religion, on culture, on attitudes. They, um, in terms of disciplinary approaches, uh, historians took obviously historical approach. There is literary approach, theological sociological, and then when you start talking about emotions, the hatred and all kinds of things like that, also psychological, right? And very few um, scholars have thought or have engaged with social structures and the way society um, uh, functions uh, uh, as well. Um, I have been teaching a class, team teaching a class with my colleague, um, Wes Alsenat, um, on anti-Semitism and racism, and it was, a, and we've also been running a series on Jewish studies and Black studies in conversation, and it becomes very clear that they are uh, the the approach to study of anti-Semitism is so different from uh, scholarly approaches to the studying of racism. Uh, they really, uh, we were we were searching. Uh, there are a lot of these um, uh, the definitions of anti-Semitism. There aren't really State Department approved or other uh, institutional definitions of racism. Uh, people don't generally think about that they need to define racism. People know what racism does, how it impacts uh, people who live racism, who live through it, who are targeted by, by racism. We can think about 
uh, Ruby Bridges, who is uh, who is here. We can we all understand what it means. I cannot breathe. Uh, we understand what racism does. We don't necessarily engage in scholarly conversations about um, about what is racism. And um, and as I've been um, uh, teaching this course and engaging with scholars also in in Black studies, um, I uh, appreciated the value of comparison and the value of uh, having a different field reflect back onto your own scholarship. Um, it brings certain clarity to what you know intimately. Uh, my students who are not sometimes coming from my own field ask different questions. In fact, the book that, um, that my last book is dedicated to them. It's you guys who inspire us to think new thoughts. Um, but uh, I'm, I was not the first one who sort of thought about these two topics, anti-Black racism and anti-Semitism together and how uh, looking at both topics can help us understand our own. So I come obviously from the perspective of Jewish studies, but here is a quote from W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, a black uh, scholar, historian, and activism activists who visited Europe at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. And then this, uh, this piece comes from his speech in 1948 after he visited the uh, ruins of the Warsaw Ghetto um, uh, after World War II. And, uh, and Du Bois um, noted that it wasn't visiting the ghetto and Europe and seeing what was called then the Jewish problem did not so much give him a clear understanding of what Jewish problem was, but rather he gained a real and more complete understanding of the Negro problem, the problem of slavery, emancipation and case. And he saw that it was no longer in a, a separate as unique. It allowed him to make connections. And in the 1930s, the beginning from 1930s through the early 60s, uh, both uh, uh, black intellectuals and Jewish intellectuals were making these connections and were looking at these, these perils, not just acknowledging that they existed, but they tried to understand why there were uh, certain uh, similarities. And that happens um, a, with the rise of Nazis uh, when um, a Jewish intellectuals are uh, are trying to debunk the idea of Jew of of Jews as a race, and black intellectuals are beginning to point out, look what's you you see what's happening in Europe. Look back at what's happening here in the United States. And they were not obviously wrong. Uh, we now know that Nazi legal scholars came to the United States and studied uh, in, um, American racial laws and then translated them into their own uh, ideological needs in Nazi Germany to apply them to Jews. But for me, as a, as a, as a scholar, the aha moment, the kind of revelation, eureka moment, came when I was watching a film by Raoul Peck, I Am Not Your Negro, and if you have not seen that film, I highly recommend it. In that film, there is a clip of James Baldwin from the uh, uh, from the PBS program, The Negro and the American Promise. Uh, and for those of you who are young enough, the word Negro was not an offensive word in this period. This was a se often a self-descriptive word that black intellectuals and black people used for, uh, for themselves. Um, as opposed to the N word, which uh, Baldwin uses very consciously because of its power and challenges white Americans to think why they needed to create the, the caricature of a black person in the slur the, uh, that, is, uh, that is exemplified by the N word. And he says, I am not the N, I am a man. But if you think that I am that, if you think that I am that caricature that you created, that means that you need him and you 
need to under, uh, um, explain and understand why you need, because I, as a black person, Baldwin says, I'm not that. You invented him. And to me, as a scholar of that has studied anti-Jewish animus, but also Jewish history, I said, ah, this is like the Jew that was created by anti a Jewish ideology and then modern anti-Semitism that has absolutely nothing to do with the living and breathing Jews who who lived their lives in uh, in wherever they 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 live. And just to give you a sense of that aha moment, what what came through my mind. So this is an example of an early 20th century book, uh, which actually denies the very humanity of black people. So you'll see some offensive images here. Um, where they contrast the caricature of a black person with the white and Christian, that's important, a Christian figure, uh, making the parallels between um, whiteness and sort of divine presence. Here's another one, um, Virgin Mary and Child Christ as, again, white and, uh, and, and the caricature of a, of a black child uh, trying to uh, make this, you know, question, que give, make people question the the humanity of of black people. Now, this is what I mean by the, by the Jew, by the caricature of the Jew, contrasted to uh, to the, uh, the 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 white figure here, a European figure, and this comes from a Nazi children's book, uh, and here maybe less. Uh, um, uh, more more uh, mainstream, uh, if you will. This is an um, an image from uh, Charles Dickens's o Oliver Twist. Um, Jew, the Jew Fagin is uh, caricatured here as this very menacing figure, and contrasted with the uh, Christian uh, Christian girl. And again, if you look at the aesthetic of the Christian girl, and then you look back at the aesthetic of the white girl, uh, the, the, the mechanism the, 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 is the same of representation. So as I've been reading, studying um, uh, uh, both su subjects, both for research and, and self-interest, I kept jotting down uh, when I was reading about black history, the, the kind of powers. Oh, that sounds very similar to what Jews were called or how Jews were described. And I came up with these sort of striking parallels. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the function. Black people serve as contrast figures constitutive to white identity. Um, uh, and Jews and Judaism serve as contrast figures constitutive of Christian identity. The two are very, um, very tied together. Um, both groups, for different reasons, and this is important, parallels, but also differences. They are both considered lazy. They don't work. They don't do this physical work. But in the Jewish context, it's because they benefit from the exploitation, right? Exploitation of Christians. In the black context, they're lazy, and this is, I'm giving you a quote from, an, uh, from 1866, at the expense of white men. So exploiting versus at the expense. You can hear the difference here. Um, both are considered, if they demand something, if they uh, protest, one is considered insolent or arrogant, uh, the arrogant Jews, what are they demanding? What are they claiming? And the a petty black person, what are they demanding, right? Very similar uh, uh, idea. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, the, both are considered dangerous, historically, uh, to, in the Jewish context, to Christian uh, women, again, historically, and in the ca context of black men, dangerous to white women. And we know that these have resulted, especially in the context of black men, in lynchings and violence. Uh, here is a visual example of that, the lecherous uh, black man who is uh, ogling a white woman. Um, and uh, here is uh, also a, a sort of a scene of, of rape um, that was also um, shown in the film, the, uh, the Birth of the Nation. And here is the image from the same period of the lecherous Jew. 
uh, also ogling, seducing, um, raping uh, white uh, Christian women. The, in the film, sort of paralleling the birth of nation, you'd choose the Nazi film has this kind of rape scene. Um, they're both presented as ugly in in this as co again contrasting with the with the um, uh, figure of the of the of Christian or white European. So here you have sometimes combined together um, uh, the the caricature of Jews and black people in the uh, in in contrast to the the European um, uh, uh, representations. And both were presented as problems, as questions, a Jewish question, a Jewish problem, a Negro question, a Negro problem. Uh, and W.B. Du, du Bois asked, what does it feel to be considered a problem, right? To be con conceived of as a problem. And different, but, uh, but similar uh, as well, fears of Jewish power or oh, Jews we have to fear Jewish power and the fear of Negro rule that came out after the reconstruction. Uh, mostly Jewish power because of the, uh, of the sort of cunning uh, idea that Jews, Jews will uh, act in self-interest and the fear of Negro rule or Negro power in, in, this, in this context was of the t uh, other, uh, they're not qualified, they don't know what they are doing. It's just going to cause chaos. But in the modern period, when we have the idea of citizenship and equality before law, as we will see, uh, it's uh, ultimately refusal to accept them as equal citizens. There are questions, should we or not? And, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, so, so a scholarship and on on uh, anti-Semitism's focus on emotions on these issues, uh, racism. It's very clear. It's about power. The scholarship on the uh, on on and racism is very clear that it's about power and exclusion. Um, it's uh, about restrictions, and uh, and that's the sort of the difference in in the in the context of approaches, which I think uh, a little bit. Um, blurs our understanding of the mechanisms uh, and functions of anti-Semitism. So I had been um, thinking as I've been teaching about the, uh, the, tr the anti-Semitic trope of Jewish power. Uh, Jews are powerful. They have so much power, so much influence. Where does it come from to describe a tiny mi mi uh, minority? In this? And one of the things that became clear that it comes paradoxically from a trope of Jewish servitude, It'll be, you, uh, as, as I'm going to show you. And it emerges from the very earliest Christian texts. So when scholars think about anti-Jewish attitudes or anti-Semitism having Christian roots, they often focus on actually the story of this week. Uh, of the Passover, uh, of the Passover Easter story of Passion of Christ of crucifixion, uh, but what is often for, uh, missed is that early Christian texts show and construct a hierarchy of values, associating certain concepts and values with Jews and Judaism, and certain higher, more appreciative, more valued uh, uh, aspect. With Christianity, so here, for for clarity, I uh, highlighted in blue the concepts that are associated with Jews and Judaism from the earliest times in Christian texts: law, slavery, flesh or carnality, um, Mount Sinai, a symbol of Jewish law of the Torah, bearing children to slavery the present Jerusalem, and when, when Apostle Paul is writing it, the Jerusalem temple is still standing. Uh, Jews still have sovereignty in Judea, uh, in Jerusalem. So that is seen as, uh, again, carnal, uh, bearing children for slavery, and focused on law, right? And it really is a, a problematic translation, but Judaism comes to be seen as a legalistic um, religion. Christianity that in the 
already these earliest days is seen through more positive values, again, through sort of Greek, the, uh, Greek philosophy of the form and matter, uh, that faith is, uh, is, is something higher to the law, to, to these commandments. Uh, and Christianity is associated with freedom, right? A free woman rather than slave woman, with promise uh, rather than law or flesh. Uh, we, uh, Christianity is the Jerusalem of above, and she is free, right? So you have contrast and freedom. This is a slave society. Roman times is a slave, so not in the same way as the transatlantic slave societies with will emerge, but there is slavery in a Roman society in that period of time. Um, in the episode Romans, uh, Paul also talks uh, that, that not all Abraham's children are his true descendants, which means that it is not the children of the flesh, flesh, carnality, who are the children of God, but the children of the promise. And, and he associated the children of the fresh with Jews and the children of the promise with Christians. And then discussing what we might today call predestination or God's election, uh, not in that um, hierarchical way, but creates a, uses a, a quote from the book of Genesis, the elder shall serve the younger. And that phrase will get its own life when Christianity, in fact, will become the religion of the empire. So when Paul is writing, he's really writing from a position of weakness. He's trying to create a sort of, uh, give Christians a sense of, it's okay, we are, we are, we are persecuted, we are, but we are superior to those who have power now, right? Who, are, who have sovereignty, who have the temple, uh, who are uh, who are still uh, still uh, dominant, um, but we in fact are superior to them. When Christianity becomes an empire, not just in the, uh, when Christianity becomes a legal religion, but when it becomes empire, those verses will gain a very different meaning. And here, Augustine, uh, the author of City of God, Confessions, many of you may have encountered him. In your classes, uh, he returns to the, the the phrase "the elder shall serve the younger," and says, "Well, in our times, it means something different. Scarcely anyone among us has understood it to mean anything else than the older people, the Jews, should serve the younger pe Christian people. That primacy of the elder is transferred, right, to the younger. The elder is so passionately." craved a lentils. What could be clearer than the reference in these two promises is to the people of Israelites and to the whole world, the former according to the flesh and the latter according to faith, right? So now you have the flesh and the faith, the values, but now you also have the power relationship. Jews are to serve Christians, right? They are, they are in a different position. Uh, and he again elaborates, there are two covenants, the old and the new. One is the earthly city, the other one is the heavenly city. One is in servitude and slave in this earthly city. And since the shadow were to vanish, so it's associated, Judaism is associated with old, with earthly, with servitude, slavery, earthly, earthly city and shadows, so darkness. And then Christianity is new, representing heavenly city, a light coming from the free woman. Christianity represents the free city. You can, I hope you can see that. So that's all fine theology, right? We, we already can see a little bit of that uh, reading these theological texts and ideas in the new political context of Christian empire and the fact that Jews no longer have sovereignty, political sovereignty in Judea and, and Jerusalem temple is, is totally destroyed. Um, so now we have the, uh, the transformation 
into structure. So we all understand what structural racism means. That means that there are laws, that there are certain uh, social and political structures that limit people, that restrict people from, uh, from certain advancements or uh, limit their rights in some ways. And we begin to see the translation of theology, this idea of superiority, inferiority, into law uh, once Christian empire gets the tools of the state, so to speak. So what we have here, I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples. Um, but one of the first uh, laws is restrictions on, um, uh, on owning Christian slaves. So again, slavery uh, is, is part of the Roman, Roman Empire. And the Roman imperial law begins to prohibit Jews from owning Christian slaves. There were restrictions before uh, because the Roman, uh, uh, when it was still a pagan empire, was concerned that Jews were proselytizing, that they were converting slaves into Judaism, and they didn't quite want Judaism to expand. But here we will begin to see something else. It's not just proselytism. It's not just Jews converting slaves to Judaism. It's something else begins to happen. So on no account shall a Jew buy a Christian slave, neither shall he contaminate him with Jewish sacraments and convert him to Christian, from Christian to Jew. This is still an issue of conversion. But there are no restrictions on Christians owning Christian slaves. So it's not just about Christians not, not being enslaved. It's about Jews not having that, uh, that right to uh, to have Christian slaves. And then a few decades later, you begin to see the notion of power, uh, of Jewish power, discomfort over authority, that Jews might have some authority over Christians. If, any, if one of the Jews shall buy and circumcise a Christian slave or, or any other sect, he shall be raised from that Jew's power and remain in liberty, right? So if a, a person is enslaved by Jews, they should automatically be freed because they should not be subject to um, Jews' authority. Um, this, this law, it will come back in different ways. It will enter both church laws, but also secular laws. In, later in Europe, it will be translated to prohibition of Jews hiring Christian servants, not because slavery sort of ends in, in Christian Europe, except for the Mediterranean. Um, and, uh, and, it's, uh, and we see objections. Here is an example from Pope Gregory the Great, objections to Christian slaves being held in servitude by Jews and uh, warning the, the, the leaders, the, the rulers, that uh, according to the strict sense of the most sacred laws, no Jew is permitted to hold a Christian slave in his power. Rather, Christian slaves be found among them, they shall be given liberty. All right, so again, you, you begin to see the language of Jewish, uh, Jewish power. Other laws, anti-miscegenation law became part of the uh, legal fabric of the Roman Empire of, of Jews not being able to marry Christians. Um, the prohibition to, uh, to, uh, to serve in public office. In the pre-Christian Roman Empire, Jews were allowed to serve in public office, and there were even exemptions for them if that uh, service clashed with their religious beliefs or some uh, duties may have come on the Sabbath or, or uh, maybe there was an associated uh, service at a temple for a Jewish goddess. Uh, Jews were exempt from uh, from participating, but they could hold so, uh, public office. In when Christianity becomes an empire, uh, or Christian uh, Roman Empire becomes Christian, uh, we begin to see exclusion of Jews from public office, and again uh, with the discomfort that Jews will have authority and power over Christians. Right. So here you have. Uh, prohibition of, for Jews to practice law and serve in state service. 
so that people who Christians don't confuse that Jews have this authority and because of this mastery don't convert to, uh, to Judaism because they think, oh, it's a venerable religion. Um, why don't I convert to, uh, to Judaism? And then later on, you can see this, Jews shall not be appointed judges over Christian population, not permitted to be tax collectors, for thus Christians would be seen, God forbid, to be subjected to them. So again, that hierarchy now that was used to be this sort of theoretical, the theological hierarchy, now it is embedded in the legal fabric of, of Christian um, empire and also Christian domains, and it enters other legal codes in the Christian world. And you begin to see this, uh, this idea of power and subjection and uh, reinforcing that Jews should always be on that inferior position. This enters canon law, which is church law, but again, as I said, also secular law. And in the 13th century, it gets a much more explicit language of servitude, uh, slavery, and, uh, and uh, this is now uh, dressed up in the theological language, which you will hear echoes Paul's uh, epistles. The Jew who by the uh, Jews who by their own guilt are consigned to perpetual servitude because they crucified the Lord. They ought not to be ungrateful to us Christians and not require Christian favor with contumely intimacy with contempt. Um, the Pope then asks the French rulers to restrain the excesses of the Jews that they shall not dare raise their neck bowed under the yoke of perpetual slavery against the reverence of Christian faith, lest the children of a free woman should be slaves to the children of a slave, but rather as slaves rejected by God, Jews should recognize themselves as slaves of those whom Christ's death set free at the same time as it enslaved men that Jews should not in any way grow, uh, there grow insolent. You begin to see all those elements coming together in these texts. And then uh, you see in another, uh, another code of uh, canon law, uh, it is absurd that uh, the blasphemer of Christ exercise authority over Christian, again, Jews, that Jews should author, uh, uh, exercise authority over Christians. And they, they, it is prohibited uh, to Jews from being given preference in matter of public office, since in such capacity they're more troublesome to Christians. Okay? Um, this is a, from a text, I won't read it, but this is also repeating the same language of perpetual servitude and slavery uh, that establishes a ghetto in Rome, restricting Jews from other parts of Rome and forcing them to live in a walled area uh, in, in Rome. And again, this is to remind them that they have been made slaves while Christians have been made free through Jesus Christ. And if they, if they um, convert, then, uh, then they, they can live uh, and regain their, uh, their status. Uh, lest you think it's like, oh, this old stuff, who cares about that? Um, there are echoes, I mean, today with, as well, we'll get to it in a moment, but, um, but there are echoes here from 1945, for instance, in Poland, uh, post-war Poland. Poland is destroyed. This is the same time when W.E.B. Du Bois visits, uh, visits the Warsaw Ghetto, more or less. And, um, and Jews are actually, yes, in position of, in governmental positions of authority. And here you have a bishop complaining to the Jewish community leaders who came to him asking for help with the rising anti-Semitism and violence against Jewish survivors. And he says, well, why don't you Jews just help rebuild Poland? Why do you engage in politics? Politics is about power, right? Voting is about power. That's what's at stake here. Can you imagine what it looks like when a priest comes to the ministry and a Jewish woman is sitting there? God knows from where and treat our clergy with superiority and insolence. You guys are not supposed to be in that position. You are supposed to be in that position of perpetual servitude. 
This is also translated into visual language. In the medieval period, we have the uh, ecclesia, the church, always represented as this reigning queen with a, with a crown and a cross, and synagogue representing Judaism as this humiliated maiden, uh, blinded often, but her head down in that sort of uh, position of humiliation. Uh, and here in a modern period is that discomfort with Jews as equal citizens maybe having that, uh, uh, being in a certain position of, of uh, affluence and saying this is, this is improper, this is a twisted order. And you can see it visually because Jews are racialized as darker. They are, of course, also uh, caricatured here with big noses, big fleshy lips, darker hair. And the Christian woman is uh, is racialized as white blonde, uh, not caricatured as the other uh, other one. It's, but she's a servant, right? So that's the flip order. So what about racism? Uh, in the Roman period and antiquity, slavery exists. It's not racialized. Um, the people could be enslaved for all kinds of reasons, but it changes in with the European uh, colonization of the Americas and the transatlantic slave trade. And what we see here is our queen ecclesia, the church, is transformed in the 16th century to queen Europa. So, but she is not dominating as the queen ecclesia, the church, Judaism and Jews, she's now dominating the other uh, continents. Asia, Africa, and America. And you can see them in different sort of levels of, uh, of clothing, showing how civilized or uncivilized Europeans were thinking of these continents. Um, but they are all in that uh, humbled position with heads down uh, and, uh, and not looking up in that sort of way as Queen Europa is doing. This becomes ubiquitous. Um, painters get their a manual Iconologia, Iconologia by Cesare Ripa, telling them how they should represent all these uh, all these continents, and, and Europa is always this reigning queen. Uh, but until the 18th century, uh, Africa is not racialized as black. It's only at the height of the transatlantic tra slave trade that Africa is racialized as, as black. And, um, and uh, we see that the Christian domination that Europa still remains is translated also in laws. So you have not just as people when they were reporting on uh, on Charlottesville white supremacy, it never ceased to be white Christian supremacy. And by the word supremacy, I don't mean the kind of as we colloquially use. Oh, they are just supremacists. I mean it in the application of the sense of superiority in law and in the sort of systematic structures that society operates. And here's just one example of that. And it's a parallel example with that Roman law that I, I showed. So this is from 1705, a, a British colony of Virginia act concerning servants and slaves, uh, restricting, you can see no Negroes, mulattoes or Indians, so racialized groups, Although Christians or Jews, Moors, Mahometans, that is Muslims, that is uh, religious groups, Jews and, and Muslims and other infidels, shall purchase any Christian servant, nor any other except of their own complexion. So you have religion and race being uh, outlined here. And if any Negro mulatto, Indian, Jew, more Mahometans, so again, racial and religious groups, non-Christian groups, or other infidel, uh, shall notwithstanding purchase any Christian white servant, the, sell, the, the said servant shall ipso facto become free. So whiteness and Christianity together, not just Christianity and not just whiteness, whiteness and Christianity together are associated with freedom. The other groups are outside, they are on, on a different uh, different level. So Christianity, whiteness and Christianity is, becomes white, and in fact, liberté, liberty, freedom, is uh, often depicted as this uh, white, uh, white woman. And again, that visual 
individual continuation from our ecclesia through Europa to uh, uh, liberty. Interestingly, America changes race once the United States become a state and that they no longer see uh, America as this uncivilized continent. So here you have America in the early uh, depiction of America from the early 18th century, and then she transforms into Colombia, a white woman. To, at the same time, um, the religious aspect doesn't go away, that it, and it serves racialization of non-European groups, including Jews. So uh, Jews live all over the place um, uh, in, you know, along North Africa and, and uh, what was then Ottoman Palestine and Iraq and other places include Europe and India and, and other, uh, other areas. Uh, but what the Europeans begin to do as they expand and explore is they begin to, uh, to study and explore religious practices of, of non-Europeans. And they write volumes about that. Um, and they usually start with Jews. Jews are so, sort of like the beginning of the religion from which Christianity emerges. Uh, and, but they don't study Jews of their time. They study Jews of the biblical period. Where do, they, where do Jews in the biblical period live? Well, in Judea and what is today Israel and Palestine, right? So, so they locate Jews outside of Europe and they also describe these, what they saw primitive religion. They're like having animal sacrifices, like these uncivilized people of the other continents that they begin to see. In fact, one of the books compared Jewish biblical practices to those of East Indians. And here I, I show you a page where the, um, the uh, supposed enchantment of, of uh, serpents in, in India is compared to, the, to Moses and his staff and turning his staff into a, a serpent. He's like, oh, you see, they have the same staff. It's just this sort of this Eastern practice that they do. It's not like us uh, Christians. And you can see on the... Uh, left hand side, that sort of Christian superiority is there on the on the. In the modern times, that translates as, uh, into Jews being seen by Europeans as outsiders, as Asiatic Orientals belonging to Palestine. And here you have an anti-Semitic uh, postcard, two postcards from the early 20th century, uh, uh, showing Jews again caricatured like that against the German. Uh, German figures and saying, you know, run to uh, to Palestine, nach Palestina, or uh, run back to Jerusalem with sacks and packs, the pack, right here. So you have, so that's how it translates in the modern. So let's just review uh, what what happens. The idea of Christian or white supremacy emerges from a different place than the idea of Christian. Supremacy and superiority in the in the context of of black people it emerges from European context of power enslavement of black um, uh, Africans and, uh, and 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 dominating them and only then once black people are are enslaved and blackness is associated with slavery does the idea of race emerge it's not the other way it's not like Europeans uh, uh, thought of themselves as white and that therefore went and look, were looking for black people to enslave. No, they enslaved them first, and then they try to justify why they are doing it. So they introduce the idea of race, and then uh, develop uh, the idea of racism and white supremacy develops. Um, in the Jewish context, just to review what we were talking about, the uh, sense of su Christian superiority emerges from a moment of we weakness. It first is an idea to make early Christians feel better about their religion, but it's only later when Christianity becomes uh, an empire uh, that is translated into supremacy, into law, and that then creates that, uh, that is, sets in social structures and legal structures and a hierarchy of superiority and inferiority, but both together melding in the modern times into white Christian supremacy. 
that part Christian is never lost in this process. With the revolution, revolutionary era, citizenship, modern times, very different legal structures, uh, people are beginning to think about we the people. Who are the we the people? Are all equal according to law? Who should have rights? Who should be included? And they are genuinely asking whether, uh, whether black people and Jews should belong. Uh, at the same time as the French Revolution is happening and the idea of citizenship, Jews and black people are uh, excluded from that, at least for time being. Um, because Jews are from Asia, they cannot really be fully integrated in, like Catholics, Lutherans, and Germans. Um, we, the, the law um, should, we, we should not grant to the Jews the law and, and give them equality and the rights of French citizens. They shouldn't be equal like, like us, Europe, Christian Europeans. Uh, same thing in in that, that uh, in the Netherlands. It's all over uh, Europe. Jews cannot share in our social rights as citizens as long as they are Jews. Uh, the rights of men, uh, you know, is it the rights of men or is it the rights of Christian men? Is it the rights of citizens for all or is it only for Christian citizens? And people were debating that. And ultimately, Jews were reluctantly granted citizenship. But that's when you have the backlash of anti-Semitism. The idea of human rights was discovered only for the Christian world. Uh, some uh, Christian European intellectuals were saying, uh, and emancipation, uh, demand, Jews demanded literal parity, but they, we are a Christian nation and Jews are only a minority. So Jews were excluded. They couldn't belong. The same thing happens, but through a racial lens, in America, where citizenship is uh, is uh, conceived through racial uh, lenses, it was we the people. It could not have possibly meant uh, all these Indians, free Negroes, mulattoes, or slaves. It meant we the white people. And there are these debates, just as they were about Jews and religion in Europe. There are these debates along racial lines here, and in the of course the dread. Scott case, can a Negro become entitled to all the rights and privileges and immunities guaranteed that the instrument to the, uh, by the instrument of the, the, given to that citizen? And the answer of that case was no. It's exclusion from political power. So, uh, so that, those, those habits of thinking, I'm already I'm wrapping up, uh, that were created over centuries in case of Jews from religion into the racialized idea of Jews as both Jews and contrast figures to Christianity, but also in modern Europe, also racialized as Asiatic Orientals uh, and black people as racialized in that way, as inferior because of slavery, uh, they are excluded. And even when they are reluctantly uh, accepted into legal citizenship, um, as a, a, in the after civil war in the United States, they are nonetheless uh, pushed outside as outside and not deserving to be in these positions. And their equality is perceived as unearned and usurped power. And there are similarities, but differences. That idea of, due, of power, of that exclusion uh, looks differently. Uh, in this, uh, encapsulated in these in these caricatures. Um, in the case of Jews, this was an idiom of power. Jews were never actually enslaved. They were in an inferior legal position, but they had legal agency. Um, uh, unlike black uh, people who were enslaved, brutally enslaved, and had no legal power as slaves. Both were subjects to violence, different kind of violence. Slavery uh, uh, um, brings in different kind of violence that, that, than violence that Jews experience, expulsions, plunder, and so on. Uh, although after they both attained citizenship, there is exclusionary violence, such as lynchings, pogroms, or riots, and things like that, that are reminding them that they, are not, they don't belong. And the habits of thinking about Jews and black people mean that they don't deserve to be in these positions of power, but for different reasons. 
Jews don't deserve to be in positions of power or equality because they have too much. They are punished by God for the sins there. They shouldn't be. They should be in that inferior position. Why are they demanding to be in this position of power? And black people is because they are inferior. They are, you know, they are like this uh, here. They don't deserve to be where they are because they could not have possibly thought. So these habits of thinking as both groups as inferior through uh, slavery, through inferiority, play a role. Uh, final two slides, contemporary echoes. Um, that kind of Jews power and, uh, and meddling and black people not being able to do their own thing because they don't is, is shown here uh, in the, in the uh, slide that you can find it on YouTube. It's actually a, a, a one minute uh, video. Uh, from a congressional race in 2018, in which obviously George Soros, a Jewish person, is shown as meddling uh, in the political system of the United States and causing chaos. Uh, and of course, Colin Kaepernick is, uh, we know uh, what, uh, how, how he has been uh, uh, used by the right in that. And then just recently, uh, uh, the, uh, after Donald Trump was indi indicted by um, DA attorney, the district attorney Alvin Brack, who, as we know, is black, uh, is George Soros funds uh, Bragg. Uh, and that, again, the sort of Jews having too much power, meddling, uh, and black people, uh, but two groups daring to challenge a, a white man. So thank you, and I'll take questions. Sorry if I run out of time. You feel the question? Um, so one is that I've been teaching a class um, on uh, the history of anti-Semitism and in 20, uh, in the fall of 2016, and my students began to notice that the rhetoric that was used uh, in 2016, uh, uh, mostly against immigrants, but also other uh, racial groups, reminded them of what we were reading in class. So my students began to ask questions about these, these, uh, these things. And, and as I said, as I've been reading, I've been jotting down in the books that I've been reading about black history, these kinds of similarities, just just out of my own interest, um, and and it and it, it it made me force me to think that there's more just oh these people who hate Jews also hate black people these people who are racist also are anti-Semitic but there must be an explanation and especially when you have such uncanny parallels for people who have had such drastically different historical experiences, that something needed to, you needed a deeper explanation than just saying, oh, they just hate other people. So that's what inspired me. Thank you. Okay, will, will the slides be available online? Will the slides be available? Um. It, you see, I grew up in the Rockaways, which is literally patriotic, and they, I, I didn't think that. You see, they are wary of liberals, even nowadays, and it's maybe because they're a little patriotic. So, and that, what you showed me you know, was like some sort of red pill to contrast to what my community is saying. You know, like <laughs> they believe the the whole, they watch Fox, my parents watch Fox News and that they somehow are, <laughs> and somehow believe in some conspiracy theorists, but not all of them, but they do believe in some. So why would you, so 
Is it true that there are some similarities to blacks and Jews? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, in terms of um, thinking by those who were um, in positions of power uh, and conceiving them as as outsiders, not belonging, uh, there were there were parallels in that way, and especially in modern society, as the modern society conceived itself uh, along the lines of citizenship and legal equality, right? Is who belongs to the we? How do we conceive the we? And we have today the debates too, right? Some people uh, define American, uh, being American and America as a fabric of different cultures, of diversity, of that's what makes us as a you know land of immigrants and different races strong and some people say no america was just as the as i showed you the slide and the debates over the missouri um uh, entrance to the union uh that some some of the law, uh, legal uh, some of the representatives saying no 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 how can you interpret this constitution in this way, how can you interpret that that black people and all these other groups would have been considered as we the people when in fact it was founded by the you know European uh, men and that they, they surely must have it. So we are we we still have the legacy of the, that you are telling us about your family's experience. We're still participating in that same debate that was taking place in the revolutionary period and then in the eight, eight, 19th century about who belongs, how do we conceive what America is. So, so what, what you're witnessing is exactly the same debates, but what I'm trying to, to show you is that what we think is that our moment has deeper roots and that we sometimes may carry ways of thinking without even realizing how deep they go, right? Many people who might be um, thinking about Jews having power, they are not thinking Paul. They are not p thinking Roman law. But the, the, the habits of thinking and the way then law reinforced these habits of thinking, like, oh, you are Jewish and you have a Christian servant? No, you should not be. I'm going to take you to court, right? It reinforced certain sort of hierarchical thinking. And we may be carrying these ideas without realizing where they are coming from. So. There's one over here. <clears throat> uh, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I, I find myself writing a lot lately about uh, arguments about anti-Semitism on campus. And whenever I do, whenever I talk about it, I feel like I need to put in a parenthetical, oh, by the way, Islamophobia is also an enormous problem and it's not getting nearly much attention, but in some ways it's worse. So I'm wondering, I was wondering while you were talking, if images of Arabs mm -hmm. and Muslims came up in similar ways to the way you saw Jews and Blacks portrayed, because I, they, that gelled in my mind as you were speaking. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So two, I'll, I'll answer it in two ways. One is that that social and political and religious hierarchy that Roman law and Roman empire um, creates, uh, and this is not direct answer to your question. I'll get to your question in a moment, but I want to contextualize it is then applied in the Islamic empires as well in the dimitude, right? So, so, so that, that idea of certain religion is a dominant religion and tolerates other religions. In the Western uh, European and then American context, um, it, it, it works because it, the, the centuries of what I've outlined create this European sense of identity as Christian. Again, even when it's secularized, even when it's liberté, it still is grounded in this Christian hierarchical thinking of both whiteness and 
again, Europeans only begin to conceive themselves as white uh, with the with the uh, European imp imperial uh, expansion and Christian. And therefore, when you have in the West um, Muslims coming into Europe, or as we've seen in the uh, in the Virginia law, uh, which excludes Liz, Jews and Mohammedans, right? That, that's that's the 18th century way of speaking Muslims. This is playing itself out. That crucial sort of identity um, that emerged over these centuries in a, in a gradual process is encapsulated in the conscious or unconscious whiteness and Christianity in both Europe and the United States. And therefore, these groups that don't fit, whether it's Jews, whether it's Muslims, or people of color, even if they are Christian, um, that, uh, that challenges that, that, uh, that, that, that cohesiveness that we, the people, are conceived in a certain way. So the, the, there, is very, um, there is very little in the 19th and early 20th century, there are very few Muslims uh, here in America to begin to challenge that uh, in a visual way. And in Europe as well, that is not seen. But you have Orientalism, right? In 19th century Europe, and you have this idea of Orientalism uh, where, where it creates a certain image of an Arab. And it's mostly, and that's, that, that it's dangerous for, again, sexualized reason, right? Carnal and that kind of similarity. But it's, it, it's more, they are presented more in the da danger um, uh, because of the military power, right? This is this legacy of, of Islam as a military power threatening Europe. Uh, over the over the, the centuries, um, the connection that is also worth thinking about is that the in um, so slavery um, continues in the Mediterranean, uh, even if it ends in the Christian Europe. Uh, but the uh, Jewish, the idea of Jewish servitude, and therefore the end and conversion of Jews of that servitude. Is is used um, to justify the expansion and the enslavement of black people, uh, and so it's used against Islam. Um, that that uh, the Pope justifies the expansion to Africa because they are Muslims and therefore they should be converted because they are like Hagar in perpetual servitude to Christianity. Um, uh, so that language is translated onto Islam and grafted into the conception of of that of that position, and then it is uh, later on just uh, further justification for expansion and conversion, initially conversion of of the enslaved people. So there is a continuity as well that, uh, but there's also a, a a real difference in in understanding. That Jews are living in Europe all these centuries. Again, some, not 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 all Jews, uh, and they and they are this this theologically important contrast figures. Islam never functions as a theological contrast figure to Christianity. It is a military uh, danger, and it is they are conceived as infidels that need to be either vanquished or uh, converted. Um, thank you, Professor. That was a wonderful talk, very meaningful. Um, um, one of the, the things that sort of comes towards the end of the history that you're describing is, and I'd love to hear your reflection on it, is how each of these groups sort of buys into the biases about the other. So I know that, you know, my in my own family history, my Jewish great-grandfather was in Mississippi in the 1880s and 90s. And right around that time, I think maybe 1905 or something, five or something uh, Booker T. Washington gave a speech where he described um, uh, blacks in America as sort of like the Israelites of this country. And there were Jewish newspapers in the South who were like, how dare you? How dare you compare us to them? Because it was important for Jews to be identifying with whites because of the power structure. 
And similarly, you know, with, you know, certain black liberation movements in like the 60s, there was anti-Jewish articulation buying into some of these same arguments. I just would love if you have any reflections on sort of how that then plays out within these communities against each other, because it's been a fraught and important relationship. Yes, it's been fraught and, uh, and it's an important question. So I think the legacies of both are important, right? So um, the, the idea that Jews are in, and Judaism is inferior um, leaves a stamp of legacy uh, and on, even on black Christianity as well, right? Um, and then Jews are legally white, that is, Jews were able to immigrate and naturalize into the United States. The 19, 1790 Naturalization Act allows only free white people to immigrate into the United States. So those citizenship is not defined in the U.S. Constitution, though you have to wait decades until it sort of begins to be even debated, like 1820 is the first time when it's truly debated what does it mean to be a citizen. What is a denizen? What is a resident? They don't know. They use the word, but they don't know. But the one place where it is defined is who can be naturalized as a citizen. And that is the white and free person. So Jews are able to be naturalized in that way, right? And it's not necessary that it, and they conceive themselves as white because of the racial, uh, racial uh, structure of idea of citizenship in the United States. Right? You don't want to be black because it's not just the color, although that plays a role, but it's a different legal status. And that's something that is often lost in the, in the conversation, that it's about these structures. It's about political structures. It's about citizenship, right? So, and it is manifested in a way that if you have Jews being excluded from hotels, they go and protest. They go to the, you know, to the government uh, when, when Dewey, um, Melville Dewey, who you might know from the Dewey Decimal System, excluded Jews, actually Jews and black people from his club in Lake Placid. Black people could be a servant at his Lake Placid. Jews could not be admitted uh, as guests to to the uh, uh, to the uh, to the club. Um, Jews went and protested because they had the political power. And I don't mean Jewish power, but they were citizens. They could go and protest with the governor. When about the same time, uh, a black official uh, from the customs office was refused service, there was a little New York Times mention that so-and-so was refused service. There was no kind of outrage because that was accepted. There were laws that, uh, in some places, so there is a distinct, again, not just the, the sort of racialized difference, but it's a, a, it's a legal difference in, in what would be. So socially, as Jews were excluded from clubs, from hotels, from other things, but legally, they, they were able to exercise their citizenship rights. Uh, black Americans were not. They were, I mean, even today, anti-voting rights, right? Pro that's not something that would ta that was ever targeting Jews. And I think if, if it goes only in those sort of discussions about attitudes and this, we are missing a big part of the story that perhaps may help people understand how racism functioned and functions and how anti-Semitism functioned and functions, right? And there are uh, differences. And that's what, for me, uh, was so clarifying to study it side by side. So the book like switches back and forth. Each chapter goes to a different thing and, and looking at the differences. Because I've heard people say, well, we were discriminated, Jews in America, we were discriminated too. They were not allowing, they were covenant uh, not allowing. And, 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 you know, not knowing this, and I didn't know what to, what to say. Now I understand that there are real meaningful legal differences and that we might be missing in the context of, of, the, uh, of uh, discussing this only in terms of biases, prejudices in this way without understanding the, the structures and how they function. Okay, so I, I just want to be conscious of time because I know some folks might have another uh, class to get to. Um, but uh, 
Thank you for coming. Yeah, I, thank, I'm happy to take you. more questions. Thank you. I can hang out. Uh, so if you have any questions or you can reach out to me, I uh, may take me a few days to respond, but I will. <laughs> any other questions? Yeah, and we, I, I don't think there's anything else in the room after this. So if folks can and want to uh, stay for a little longer, if you have the time.